Well, I always mention there are outlines, and looking at the audience tonight, I don't believe I'll be adding anything to it. It should be pretty consistent to what's there. Unless we have a visitor, then expect me to change it on the fly. I thought tonight I'd talk a little bit about what I owe to the Portage congregation, and as I mentioned, I'm looking out at who I see in the audience. In essence, I'm somewhat preaching to the choir because we are the ones who are consistently here. But I think the majority of us realize that um, to the church of the Lord in every city, those who've been added to the church, they're under certain obligations to the extent of whatever their ability will allow them. But when we begin to focus not on the universal body of Christ, but we begin to think about the local body of Christ, we also understand that both you and I are under certain obligations. And so I want to spend just a few minutes, and I actually mean that, looking at the question of what do I owe the Portage congregation. Well, let's start off by one of the probably most basic things that we owe the local congregation where we worship on a regular basis, and that is, is that each of us owe her the example of a good life. Certainly, we want the congregation here to radiate light to the local community which is around us. And most of you know, whether we like it or not, uh, some are going to judge this congregation by the lives of its members that they know, possibly even by uh, the members that they have heard about. And so, certainly we owe this congregation to be a good example to those who are, are around us. Listen to Titus 2.12. Paul tells Titus here, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world. Now, let me spend just a couple of minutes breaking this down because if you were to look here at Titus 2.12, really what you have is a basic pattern for godly living. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but let's look at three specific words here in Titus 2.12. He talks about being sober or living soberly. If you look that word up in the Strong's, you'll actually find that the way they try to uh, describe it is one with a sound mind. It could also mean temperate or temperately or discreetly. You begin to look at this word soberly, what they're trying to get across is that we as Christians, we ought to be moderate in all things. If I were to try to describe it to somebody in words that are easily understood, what I would say is it's, it is using godly wisdom in combination with self-control. If one does that, they use godly wisdom and self-control, and no matter what situation they're in, they will be, um, they will be Sober, okay? Another way to look at it would be as if you were driving down the road. The idea of sober is driving right down the middle of the line, not going to the left, not going to the right. It's making that decision that keeps you right there in the middle where you ought to be. And so we see that we're, we're told to be temperate or to, to use godly wisdom with self-control. And we're also told that we are to live righteously. Now, Strong's, again, they define this as, as being just. And I think just is an extremely good word to... Uh, <laughs> put in place of righteous. Uh, it also says to be proper, proper or properly as right or to be uprightly. Well, if you were to think of being uh, righteous, a good way to understand that would be when somebody stands upright according to the presence of God, according to God's standards, not according to man's standards. And so we talk about being righteous, it means to be in good standing with the will of and the Word of God, because you can't separate the Word of God from the will of God. And so we are to be moderate, we are to use godly wisdom and have self-control. That allows us to also be righteous or to be in alignment with God's will. And then we're told to be godly. That may be a hard word to kind of describe to somebody. How does one act Godly. Well, if you look it up again in the Strong's, you'll find them describing it as being pious. And so, to be godly is to live after the manner of God. Now, that may be hard to describe to somebody. When you say you should live after the manner of God, they may ask, well, how exactly is that to, to take place in my life? Well, again, the only way to describe somebody the manner of God would be go to, to go back to the Word of God and to look at the things He's told us to do. And so when we talk about the word here, godly, again, we're emphasizing the attitude which would lead one to a righteous life. I don't really think you could probably find a better verse that would give the pattern for how one ought to live. It pretty much sums it up. Use godly wisdom with self-control. Live in a manner in which you are seen as righteous in God's sight. And in such doing, you are acting 
godly. You are acting according to the will and the word of God. Now, these traits that we've just looked at, obviously, I think they're necessary in promoting a good name for our congregation. How many of you would want to have somebody who attended this congregation who was, who was known throughout the city as one who was constantly involved in sin and was never addressed? It, it, it brings a lot of um, reproach upon the church. And so we understand that one of the things we do in our personal lives is to live in such a way that it brings, it brings um, those to an understanding that we are a faithful congregation. I bring that up, and I won't spend much time on it. I'd mentioned that there was a gentleman this week he's not on my facebook anymore but there was a gentleman this week who had posted two different times articles by men who teach false doctrine uh, the sad thing is is that that guy is a minister in the church and after i corrected him and, and showed him and sent him the links he said yeah I, I know but you know this is my facebook page i'll post what i want what do you think about a guy that that willingly will do that what would you think about the congregation that would allow a minister to do such things I bring all that up because my point is, is we often question people's motives and we question their faithfulness based on the association or the promotion of doctrinal teaching. And people do the same thing with us. We may not like it, but they do. That's the bad side of the coin. You've then got the good side of the coin. On the opposite side of the coin, ask yourself this. When you see a congregation that always brings in men who are known to preach the truth, when you know of a congregation that always affiliates themselves with other congregations that always teach the truth, what does that make you think about that congregation? It makes you understand that that's a congregation who is trying to follow God's will. It reassures you that if they were to have, for example, a gospel meeting, for the most part, you could trust that you could go there and you're going to hear the truth based on, on the past. Now, you still always have to be careful, but it helps to give you that reassurance. We want people around us to have a reassurance that this is a good, faithful congregation based on the lives of its members. And so as you want to sum up, probably the most important thing we could do for this local congregation is simply to lead a good, holy life, just to live according to God's Word. We also owe the congregation's visitors, and I think that we do that here. Certainly we want visitors when they come here to feel at home. Uh, you know, I was thinking back when I was a child, I had one aunt. Every time I went to their house, and I only probably got to go there once or twice a year. Have you ever gone into a house where the very second you walked in, it just felt like home? You ever been to a place like that? I had one aunt's house. That, that's how it felt. It, it wasn't normally clean. Uh, there was a lot of kids running around. But as soon as I walked into that house, I always felt like I was at, I was at home. Well, that's really what we want people to feel like when they come here. We want them to come in to this congregation, and we want them to immediately feel like they're at home. When you begin to think about the fact that this is God's family, we also want them to understand it is God's family, but God's family is ever-growing. And so certainly we want visitors to have an understanding that, that we want them to be added to this family, according to the gospel. Matter of fact, you go back, Ephesians 3.15 says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We want them to become Christians, right? We want to show them how it is that Christians live. And the Christian family is to be a family where, from the very minute you walk in the door, you feel like you're at home. How many of you have been to a congregation before, a faithful congregation, and the very first time you visited, you felt like you were supposed to be there? There are oftentimes I have visited congregations where as soon as I got there, uh, of that congregation, I felt like I was walking into a place I had been before. And so part of the congregation is welcoming the visitors, making them feel welcome, and then as they're there, to begin to show them how to emulate Christ, how to, how to treat other people. Well, certainly we as Christians, and we've talked about this a number of times, we have to learn to respect all men and certainly to love the brotherhood. Let me give you two passages here. 1 Peter 2.17. This one pretty much sums it up. We could, we could use, use this one. It says, honor all men. When it says all men, it means all men. He says, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That's interesting if you go back and think about that. How is it that Peter could say that? How could Peter say, honor the king? Well, if you go back and you look at the book of Romans, you'll actually find the same thing. We are to honor all men. We're to be respectful of those who are in authority. We're to love the brotherhood and we're to fear God. And we're to do everything according, though, to God's will first. And so... We understand even though we respect those who are in authority, if it contradicts God's word, 
we're bound to God's Word first. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. I mentioned that this morning. If you don't love the church, if you don't love the brethren, something's amiss in your life, and you need to find out what that is. This type of love that we can show visitors, it, it's a contagious type of love. I remember, and my wife probably does too, the very first time we attended a Church of Christ, I bet we got three or four, maybe more, cards uh, in the mail that week. And as a matter of fact, they, they remembered her as soon as she walked back in last time she was there. That's, that made a big uh, impression for us that as soon as we had visited, immediately there were people reaching out to us. We do the same thing here, and that's what we want to continue to do to draw in our visitors. We want our visitors to feel welcome. We want them to continue to come back on a regular basis, not just them. We oftentimes have those who are already Christians who come and visit with us on a fairly, fairly regular basis, and we want them to. Notice what Paul writes to the church there in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. That's really how, how Christians ought to be when they're in different parts of the world in congregations and they know each other, right? They should desire to want to see one another. We also should want the same for those who are visiting with us. And so whether these visitors are non-Christians and they need to be taught the gospel or whether they're Christians and they're just visiting with us, they're our guests. And so we're going to treat them accordingly with love and with respect. We're going to make them feel welcome when they come in. Notice Proverbs 18.24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Well, that's, that's exactly true. Would you guys want to go to a congregation where you didn't feel like people were friendly towards you? You ever been to one of those? I've been to a congregation like that before. We don't want to be that type of a congregation. And so we understand when visitors get here, we can't stand back and just wait for someone else to go in to say hi. Uh, Oftentimes what happens here, I think, is because we are such a loving group, we kind of bombard them, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's much, much better than when you go to the congregation. And I've heard of people where this has happened. They came in and they, they sat in the back row like Larry back there, and <laughs> he's waving. And, and nobody said hi to him. Do you guys know why visitors normally sit in the back row? It's because they don't feel comfortable. They don't know anybody. They want, I think they want to be in the closest seat to get back out of the door. We have to be ready to stop them before they get out and to tell them that we're glad they're here and to welcome them in. Listen to Hebrews 13, 12. And we used this verse this morning. And again, we'll put it back into context. Hebrews 13, 12. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now the Hebrews writer, again, he goes back, he simply is using an Old Testament example to try to teach the those that he's writing to, the understanding of courtesy and hospitality to strangers. And that's exactly what we want to do. We owe that to our visitors. We owe the men who are leading the congregation. Yeah, you begin to think about the congregation here and in maybe other places you know. No congregation makes any progress without faithful and efficient leaders. As a matter of fact, what oftentimes happens is when congregations no longer have faithful and efficient leaders, you know what happens. They begin to veer off. So we understand the need for uh, faithful men. To a certain extent, the members of the church, they really make or break the congregation's leadership. Uh, have you guys ever known of congregations where, where there was constant bickering and fighting over the direction that was chosen? That happens in a lot of congregations. Uh, and so we have to understand that, that we have to support the, uh, the leadership when they're following God's law. Now we understand this here, we don't currently have elders. But we do have a number of men who willingly serve the congregation. John, John doesn't have to lead singing. Jerry, leading prayer. I'm looking at all the people here who fill in and lead the congregation. We need to begin to think about them, and, and we need to have this understanding that for them to be strong, for them to be more efficient, we have to give their support while also at the, t at the same time making sure that I don't, I don't bring reproach upon them through my actions. And again, remember, people will judge the congregation you worship at by the way that you live. We want to help the, the men who are leading the congregation. Notice what Paul says to the church there in Philippi, Philippians 2.15. He says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation 
among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You know, when you have a congregation that lives like that, it makes the, it makes the job of helping lead the congregation a whole lot easier. Congregations where people don't live like that, you have people that have to deal with the problems over and over and over again. You guys realize how much that taxes on the guys who are trying to keep the congregation sound and safe? And so we have to remember that we've got to live in such a way as to help them out. Uh, living, living faithfully in the world, it, it helps keep from bringing reproach. It keeps them from having to address situations, but they need a whole lot more than that. And I guess we could sum it up as this. The men who are, who are leading the congregation, uh, those who are leading their families, they need, they need the prayers of the congregation. We should be praying for those men on a regular basis and remember that we should help them wherever it is that we can in their work. We also owe giving to the church as we've been prospered. And you know, I won't spend very much time on this. And let me say this, because I don't know who's watching this. I know that you guys know this, but I want to say it again. At this congregation, we are not concerned with money. That is not what we're concerned about. We're concerned about men's souls. We're concerned about our own souls and trying to get to heaven. But with that being said, we understand that there is a command for us to give to the local congregation. The, the congregation has financial obligations that have to be met on a regular basis, whether we like it or not. We pay for somebody to take the trash out. That bill gets sent whether we put trash in there or not. And there are a whole host of other bills. Whether I give or whether I don't give, the bills will continue to come here. And the works that we're involved in, they'll continue to cost. And so I owe the congregation and I owe her works and I owe the leadership which is here, the support uh, through the monetary manner, if I'm possible, so that the congregation can be effective in the work of the Lord. Listen to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, now we're told when to do that, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, I won't spend a whole lot more time, but you go back and you talk about giving. And I know a lot of people are in the religious world, they're focused on giving. We're not told how much to give. Let me emphasize that again, because that false idea of tithing is rampant in the religious world today. We are not told how much to give. We are, however, told how we should give. This isn't in your notes. You can go back to 2 Corinthians 9, 7. We're told that we're to purpose in our heart. We're also told that we ought to give uh, without being grudgingly. Let me break them down a little bit. To purpose in my heart means that I know this is X amount of money that I get, and I know that this is the amount of money I can give after I pay my bills, and then whatever's left, that's for me. But I have to determine a certain amount. The amount's not told in the Scriptures, but I have to purpose or determine the amount I will give. I then have to give without grudgingly. God's not going to be pleased if I could give a check every week, a big check, and then as soon as it got into the basket, I went... I hate giving that money over the... That's grudgingly, right? You don't want to give like that. There are people that give that way, but we don't want to give like that. We also have this understanding that we are not to give of necessity. You might say, well, how is that possible? I'm not to sit in my, in my chair and as the basket begins to come around, I only put the check in there because I know that maybe Wendy or somebody would see me not put a check in and then they might go, hey, did you notice they didn't give it? I don't give out of necessity. I'm not giving because I feel like I have to give. As a matter of fact, if you were to spend a little more time on it, it goes on and says God loves a cheerful giver. That's what God wants. The word there actually uh, is, could be translated hilarious. You should give to the point where it makes you feel so good that you literally bubble up with almost laughter. That's how we should give. So we're not told how much to give, but we are told that we should give, and we know that it's necessary for the local congregation. All right, I'll move on. That's the part nobody wants to hear about. We also owe the attending, uh, I owe attending the congregation's assemblies. The very existence of every congregation is dependent upon those who show up on a regular basis. If no, if no one shows up, there's not really any reason to, to even have someone show up to preach, right? If there's no one in the building, now if one person shows up, I guess go ahead and preach, but... I guess after a while, you know, after maybe three, four, five, six months of nobody ever showing up, I guess the preacher would probably quit coming. So we have the understanding that the very existence of having a congregation means that there are Christians who would go there. I think that's fairly logical. And we understand that if the attendance is the life of the church, and certainly it is, 
uh, we have to come together and, and, and to exhort and to encourage one another. For that very reason, I attend all of the services that I can. Okay? With that being said, we're not going to come and harass you if your car breaks down and you missed a service. We understand that, right? But there's a big difference between wanting to be at service and not being able to make it and deciding, well, I know they're meeting, but I'm not going to go because I have other things to do. Totally different attitude, right? So we have the understanding that we should want to be with the congregation on a regular basis. I don't think anybody would want it to be said of a congregation. You know, the reason that the congregation quit meeting there is because they got down to where there was only three or four people. And with three or four people, let's go back to the previous point, there was never enough money to pay any of the bills, and eventually they had to sell the building. You guys know that that's happened in a lot of places? Uh, you, hate to, you hate to bring that stuff up in a sermon because it comes across as negative. But here's the harsh reality. There are a lot of congregations who are closing their doors. And let me give you another stark number. I didn't look this up, but when I looked it up about six months ago, did you know that about 50% of the Lord's churches, congregations, they don't have an, they don't have an active minister? It's getting worse. It's getting, we're, we're one, of the, one of the unusual ones if you begin to think about it. There are congregations struggling all over. Part of that's because they don't have a regular body that meets there on a regular basis. So we'll move on from that. But, but we owe the local congregation gathering at its assemblies. We go back and look at Hebrews 10.25. It's a passage you're familiar with. I'm, again, probably preaching to the choir. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Notice this. It was a problem in the first century, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So I, I owe it to the congregation to meet on a regular basis. I also owe it to the congregation to try to help the congregation grow. I think all of us would say we want the congregation to grow both spiritually and numerically. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Each of us at one point was a brand new Christian. We needed somebody to help us along, somebody to encourage us, to really give us, as we would call it, milk, because we couldn't handle meat, so that we could grow spiritually. But when that process is done right, what happens is, is one, one newborn babe grows up into a mature Christian, and they, they bring in another newborn babe. They help another one be added to the body. And so when we grow in the Word, we also begin to grow as a congregation as we're continuing to reach out. Let me say something here for just a second. There are a number of you that teach our youth. I don't think you guys realize the extent of the work that you're doing. Some people look at that as babysitting. That is not babysitting. That is not babysitting. What you guys are slowly doing is giving them the milk that they can handle. What you're doing is preparing the seed for others who may one day be young Christians. And they're going to be the ones that are going to help bring other Christians into the body. Listen to 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace... And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that's what even our littlest ones who can barely speak, that's what they're doing. They're beginning to grow in that knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I think all of us would, would say that our goal is to grow in our relationship to Christ. And we understand that we can't grow in our relationship with Christ if it's separated at all from the Word of God. I know the religious world around us would tell you that you can. Notice 2 Timothy 2.2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You can't read the scriptures and talk about those who are proclaiming God's word or those who are trying to grow uh, in God's grace and find that it's ever separated from the word of God. And so we have this understanding that as we grow, we need to help others grow. It's not enough for me to know. What I need to be doing is helping others know so that they can help take, take on the additional tasks here, if not even help take our place when we're not around. We're helping the church to continue to go after we're gone. And so I have to set myself up after the task of winning souls. I can do it in a lot of ways. We can preach, we can teach, we can go out and we can uh, persuade through conversation with people. We can have personal Bible studies. Uh, there are a number of avenues that we can try to bring the gospel to the lost. All of it requires persistent effort. But if I don't feel prepared to do any of those things, you know what I could do? I could simply give out the cards that we have. I could, I could just invite somebody to church. 
uh, and we can let it take place from there. Next, this will be the last one. I owe the congregation my heart, my warmth, and my willingness to forgive and forget. We know that congregations can't thrive when, when it's a very cold atmosphere. Have you guys ever been to a congregation that felt cold? I have before. How many of you would like to attend a congregation that feels like that? We don't, and neither do visitors. And so we have to make sure that, that we, we allow our congregation to be a place where people feel welcome. I'm talking about even the visitors. Uh, we have to make it a place where hearts are warmed, where it seems open for us to develop stronger relationships, for us to get maybe to know people that we've not spent much time with. Uh, when you guys were growing up, do you guys, any of you remember where maybe you went to school with somebody for five years and you never really knew them, you never really talked to them, and then all of a sudden you had the opportunity to talk to them and you became good friends? I'm thinking of one individual in particular. I've mentioned him before. Uh, we didn't get along. Matter of fact, we didn't get along at all. Uh, I, ha I was forced to bail hay with that guy for an entire summer. I became friends with that guy. Uh, we need to often understand that sometimes, even though we may not know somebody very well in the congregation, if we would get to know them, oftentimes we would become hard, hard fast friends. And so I owe it to the congregation to, to not only be open myself, but to also make it a place where I'm open to developing relationships with others. I also owe the congregation, and I'm not thinking of anything in my mind at all, but I owe it to the congregation to be willing to forgive and to forget when things take place that ought not to take place. And again, I'm not thinking of anything in particular, but we all know that in congregations there'll be fighting. There'll, it's just like, a, it's just like our, our earthly family. Our spiritual family is no different. You're going to have disagreements. Things are going to happen. And just like an earthly family, our spiritual family has to remember we've got to learn to forgive and forget. Now, with that being said, I have to always be careful when I make that type of a statement. There are oftentimes a process that needs to be gone through. But when that's done, we need, to, we need to remember that's the goal is to bring back and have a united congregation. Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So as I draw this to a close, let me finish with Paul. Paul, as he writes to the church there in Ephesus, he says, from whom the whole body, this is Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, we're talking about each individual, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let me give you the paraphrased version of that. Each body has people who are very good in certain areas where others are not. And the entire purpose of this, the the effectual working of each person is for the purpose of increasing the body. With that being said, I guess our concern is this. Are we as individuals doing what we can to increase and strengthen this local body? Certainly one of the things we want to do is make sure that everyone has an understanding about how to be added to the church. Again, I won't spend much time on it, and, and tonight I will only use Jesus' words. But as we go about trying to teach people I don't think there's many who would say they are followers of Christ who would deny the words of Christ. We'll just use Christ's words. As we try to explain to someone how it is that they can become a Christian, we understand that if, if one does not believe, they're going to die in their sins. John 8, 24. Because of that, Jesus has told us that we need to repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3, and that we need to confess Him, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. Uh, we need to be immersed in water, for the remission of sins, Mark 16, 16. That's the very simple message. We can literally preach the gospel or teach the gospel to somebody in really less than two minutes. And that's looking each verse up. You don't really need any more than simply what Christ has told us to do. When one has done that, when they've heard the word and they believed, when they've repented, when they've confessed, when they've been immersed, they're then added to the body by the Lord Himself, Acts 2, verse 47. That's the simple message that we're trying to get out to the world. Is that a message that you can proclaim to somebody? If not, what I would encourage you to do is open your Bible up and just write those verses down uh, on the first page. If you're here and you're a Christian, are you doing what you can to help the local congregation? Are you doing what you can to help yourself be faithful? If you're not, there's a way that we can help you spiritually. You can simply come forward and stand as we sing a song of invitation.